Thank you uh, for joining us today for Opportunities in Space, the Lunar Gateway, Canada Arm 3, and New Space. Uh, my name is Craig McClelland, and I'll be your host and MC today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I uh, see the video came up here. We've got Dave from MDA on one side and Daryl from Space Place Canada on the other. I'll be giving a more fulsome introduction in a minute. So. Uh, yeah, just to kick things off, uh, we're here in uh, downtown Toronto today talking about space. Really happy so many folks could join us. I, I see we've got a good number of you uh, viewing us online, so so that is great and exciting. Um, quickly run through who we have here today, and then I'll uh, pass it over, and you can start hearing from the, uh, the much more interesting people. So, uh, you know, we're going to have uh, Daryl from Space Place Canada. Uh, is going to be speaking about their organization. We have Brian Gallant from Space Canada, Dr. Robert Z from Space Flight Labs. Uh, we have Lori and Dave from MDA who are going to be talking about uh, the, their their company working for them uh, or being a supplier. And my name is Craig McClelland. I'm with FedDev Ontario and I'm the aerospace lead on our industrial participation team. So to get us um, uh, to, oh, just a quick reminder to everyone, we are recording today's event. Uh, that will be made available through Space Place Canada's YouTube channel uh, following the event. We also have a live Q&A that's available to everyone who's on the call. So if you have any questions, please feel free to use that. Um, and we will, we will get to those uh, a little later in the session today. Now, the plan is to take about an hour to go through all of our presentations and then have an open uh, open panel discussion here at the end to go over some of the questions that uh, that have been asked throughout the event. Uh, I think that is about it for logistics. Uh, for those of us in the room, we've gone over everything we need to here, so uh, hopefully we're all good. And I will uh, pass it over to uh, Daryl Kahnenbelt. Close. Oh my <laughs> goodness, I've practiced this too before. I'm sorry, Daryl. It's Kahnenbelt. Kahnenbelt, thank That's you. That's okay. Sorry, with uh, Space Place Canada. So please thanks, uh, Craig. take it away. I appreciate it. And thanks uh, for having us here. And Dave, thank you for joining us as well. And to all of our participants who are watching us uh, today remotely and virtually and joining us remotely. Um, I have a few opening remarks. I'll share this with you. And then after um, everyone speaks, I'll have an opportunity to answer any questions. I'll do my best to answer them. And uh, anything else we can do, we can take offline. Um, but hello everyone, have you ever wondered about the mysteries of space, uh, the vastness of the universe and what you see in the night sky? Well, just this week we watched with our naked eye telescopes, for those of you who have one, the conjunction of Jupiter and Venus. The two planets are the closest they've appeared in decades and Venus will gradually appear closer each evening to Jupiter into early March. Events like this highlight the endless possibilities of what lies beyond our planet, and our imagination takes us to places that could one day become realities. So if you say, yes, that's me, well, you might be interested in Space Place Canada. Um, it's a Toronto-based not-for-profit uh, organization of space enthusiasts from various professions. Our leadership team includes astronomers, science, educators, planetarium experts, and space enthusiasts. And I'm one of them. And as you can see on your screen, you see how Jupiter and Venus will draw closer together. It's a pretty cool event. My name is Daryl Kneinenbelt. My day job is as a strategic communications professional. As a volunteer, though, I'm a communications advisor with Space Place Canada. And I channel my inner space nerd, and I get to be part of a profound planetary purpose. And it's really cool to be part of that. 
Um, Space Place Canada advocates bringing a public planetarium back to Toronto by providing a physical and virtual space for people to explore and learn about the wonders of space, Canadian space related earth sciences, and even science, uh, technology, engineering, arts, and math. In other words, STEAM, opportunities that are accessible to all Canadians. Furthermore, a public planetarium will be an ecosystem of education, academia, science, and civic leaders collaborating to create future jobs. So let's talk a little bit about our mission. There's four points. I'll go through them briefly. Um, we want to first serve local needs, community, education, and tourism. We want to promote STEAM awareness, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, and even space, earth, and astronomy, and multiple science opportunities. We want to offer online programs. They'll be curriculum based and even serve the underserved communities. Plus, we want to spotlight job requirements, education and careers. And I want to unpack that last point a bit more. We focus on career development. That is helping young people with their careers in space. And at Space Place Canada, we use the phrase, find your place in space. Find your place in space. That includes help with making choices and understanding the education students need and the prerequisites for different careers. Every day would be career day at Space Place Canada. Space Place Canada now for our support has more than 10,000 supporters worldwide, and that's mainly through social media and an active events program. That event is part of a Toronto event. We are part of making Toronto see this public planetarium. We're the only major global tourist city without a major public planetarium. A recent Nanos poll showed that Ontarians recognize, Ontarians recognize the need for Space Place Canada and its, its contributions to education, tourism and research. Now we are looking at locations in downtown Toronto that could become a signature destination. So we need your help to help us reach our goal. Here's what you can do. We need your support and every donation counts. With a donation of $20 and your snail mail address, we will send you a unique planetarium music card. And I'm holding it on camera here. I don't know if you see it, but it's very small. Uh, if you can see it there, but it enables you to download the music of a McLaughlin of the McLaughlin Planetarium, which closed in 1995. You get this card, you scratch the back, and it'll give you access. With a donation of $100 or more in your snail mail address, anywhere in North America, uh, we'll send you a copy of An Earthling's Guide to Outer Space by Bob McDonald of CBC Quirks and Quartz fame. So that's pretty cool. So how to get in contact with us, it's quite simple. You email us at info at Space Place Canada if you wish to have a membership, application, or volunteer. That's how I joined. And um, we want to uh, you to join us for this launch. Plus, we have another event on March 7th. We have an event called Sky Culture Knowledges. It's easily found on our event Bright Space and our website. It's at uh, 7 p.m. on March 7th. That event explores the many ways cultures from around the world use the night sky and how the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada is creating one of, if not, the largest repository of sky figures from around the world. We have the RASC National President, the Director of Education for, for Digitalis, a leading producer of planetarium products and a Bitterroot Salish and Diné hydrogeologist interested in indigenous research methodologies. And they are from the Western US uh, portion of North America. So finally, just visit our website to learn more, uh, spaceplacecanada.ca. And with that, back over to Craig McClellan. Awesome, thanks, Daryl. Uh, what, a, what a great organization. And um, <clears throat> I'll say too, I had the pleasure of uh, of joining these guys at the uh, Young People's Theatre last week where they were supporting uh, the the adaptation of Chris Hadfield's uh, kids book, um, The Darkest Dark. Uh, I know my kids have enjoyed that book for, for a number of years now. So yeah, thanks. I'll, um, I'll run into a little bit about Fed of Ontario, the agency I work for, and the team uh, that I'm on here. So it's, uh, you know, really my absolute pleasure to be here and uh, love that we're able to do this today. Uh, just pull up the presentation. Hopefully that's uh, showing for everyone now. So I'm uh, I'm the aerospace and artificial intelligence uh, lead with uh, Fed the Federal Economic Development of Southern Ontario's Industrial Participation Unit. Um, our agency's been around since 2009. And uh, <clears throat> We were created following the economic uh, crisis in 2008. Uh, there were other federal regional development agencies before us. Uh, Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency and Western Diversification are, and are a couple of great examples. 
uh, that have been around for a number of decades, but uh, we're we're one of the newer ones being being created in 2009. We're here really to support innovation, uh, inclusive economic growth here in Southern Ontario, and we do that through our vision, which is really supporting you know green, clean, inclusive, and globally competitive uh, businesses and uh, ecosystem here in Southern Ontario. The, the bulk of the work our agency does is really carried out through our core funding programs. We have our business scale up and productivity fund that's targeted towards for profit entities. We have our regional innovation ecosystem that targets well the innovation ecosystem, post secondary institutes, not for profits, uh, researchers and the like. And then we have our community economic development and diversification stream of funding. This is for smaller communities outside of urban centers looking for uh, rural economic development. So under business scale up and productivity, if you're a business, you've been around for a few years, uh, you've had you've had some success, but now you're at a point where you have to make some serious investments in, you know, it could be new equipment, it could be new people, it could be new capabilities, digitalization, uh, things like that. We may have some funding to support you. FedDev can provide between half a million to $10 million of funding to cover up to 35% of your total project cost. Um, as, as a rule, we fund projects here at FedDev Ontario, so we are, uh, you know, we are going to require to, you to tell your story. A beginning, a middle, and an end of the project. What do you expect to happen from it? Why do you need our funding? And we have a whole team of people that can work with you as you try to build this up. Um, our second core stream of funding is our regional innovation ecosystem. This one really targets big picture, big ideas that are going to really move an entire industry or, or sector of an industry. Uh, some examples here are around uh, some image guided therapeutics projects that we've done with Sunnybrook Research Institute. Uh, we had the uh, the SOSIP supercomputer at the University of Toronto has been funded through some of our regional uh, ecosystem. We also have provided funding to local accelerators and incubators across the province, including Communitech, Invest Ottawa, and Mars in Toronto. Um, so it's a great program similar to our business scale up. We're looking at between half a million to ten million dollars of funding and uh, can cover up to half of project costs in this case. Um, I'll, I'll just pause for a second and, and just mention quickly that federally we have a bit of a continuum of funding that's available for innovation here in Canada, starting at the very early stage of your research with NSERC, uh, National Sciences and Engineering Research Canada. Uh, this is where you know, you're in your low technology readiness level, uh, working with a university or a college, trying to get the idea really off the ground and prove some early stage um uh things there so there's you know there's some funding available through NSERC for that kind of work moving on from NSERC you get into your national research council uh IRAP industrial research um AP uh program uh, assistance <laughs> industrial research assistance program uh IRAP is the the common we love our acronyms in in the government so I don't often know the full name of these things but uh NRC IRAP would be your next uh, your next step after NSERC uh, where you get paired up with a technical advisor that can help you with coaching advice and guidance as you're you know, building your company or your idea up to that next level. Uh, following IRAP, uh, you're looking at FedDev Ontario with the business scale up funding. And then on the other end of us, you have uh, Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada, I said, uh, who have their strategic innovation fund. And this is really for looking at providing between or $20 million is really the, the minimum that they'd look for a project. So these are national scope, big picture, uh, big changes. So about as far as way you can get from a SIF project, we have our Community Economic Development uh, Fund here at FedDev Ontario, which getting back to the third core funding stream here. Again, we can cover up to 50% of project costs, but because these are often smaller projects in smaller communities, we're looking at the 250,000 to $5 million range for that funding. Uh, we also have a number of business services, the industrial and technological benefits. I'm about to get more into that. That's um, that's where I play mostly. Uh, but we have our small business services that can provide advice and um, uh, information about support that's available to you through federal and provincial governments. That we have the accelerated growth service, which brings together uh, representatives from government departments uh, across the public service to try to help you in a coordinated way. And then there's the global skills strategy that FedDev Ontario supports by uh, by being a referring agency. So if you're looking for talent from overseas, there's uh, there's ways we could help you with that as well. Uh, connect with us. We have our website. Um, we have social media. 
<clears throat> it's really not a bad way to get in touch with us. So uh, if you have any questions, please, please find us there. Just going to get into quickly of uh, I don't have a clock here when I'm on the screen, so hopefully I'm still uh, all right time wise. Yeah, I think we're okay here. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll quickly get into Canada's industrial and technological benefits policy. Uh, basically, this is a requirement that uh, that applies to anyone who wins a major defense procurement uh, with with Canada. So if we're um, uh, so when we when we decide to buy to make a big equipment purchase or or, or services purchase. Um, this 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 ITB policy applies, and what it requires is that the winning bidder has to invest back in Canada at about equal to the full contract over the life of that contract. Uh, there are many ways they can do that, and we're here to help uh, help them understand how to do that, and then make the connections that they need. Uh, this can be done through picking up new supply chain partners, investing in collaborative research and development, and and a number of uh, other uh, ways to to sort of spur on advanced economic activity here in Canada. Uh, big benefits that we've seen through this policy. Uh, annually, we've been able to attribute over 45,000 jobs to this policy existing and nearly $5 billion of our annual GDP can be directly um, related back to, to this policy existing. It allows us to really grow and uh, strengthen our, our supply chains around some, some critical national security areas. Uh, as well as some key industrial areas such as aerospace uh, manufacturing. Uh, so, uh, you know, FedDev Ontario is, is is quite interested in this sector because of the the prominence of of the defense uh, industry here in our region. Uh, we saw, you know, we have over half of Canada's defense industry calls Ontario, Southern Ontario home. Uh, over five point three billion dollars of sales uh, a year are happening here. In, within the defense sector. Uh, we have almost half of the world's uh, top 25 uh, defense companies have a presence here in Ontario uh, where, they're, where they're actually doing work. This isn't just your sales office with a couple of people. This is R&D, this is uh, manufacturing. So it's a real you know, activity that, that creates economic activities here. And over 300 companies that are in the supply chain uh, for defense companies uh, just here in, in Southern Ontario. Uh, all of this is why FedDev is involved. Uh, it's, it's a complex policy with lots of moving parts, and we are here to help you, you navigate the waters, so to speak. Uh, you know, we, we do that with one-on-one -on -one conversations. If you're curious about understanding how, what types of transactions you might be able to pitch under this, um, what, uh, what prime contractors are looking for. Uh, we really, within our team, we have two core, core groups that we work with. We have our local stakeholders. That's industry and academia here in Southern Ontario researchers that are doing innovative, interesting things. And then we have our prime contractors and our OEMs. These are the Boeings, Lockheed Martins, MDAs, um, you know, Airbuses of the world that are seeking Canadian partners that need to get their Canadian content up. So we're really connectors here on this team and make sure everyone understands the game and uh, know who's playing and then we bring people together. Uh, Today's event is uh, is an example of that. Uh, we, we, we've got a little off script. Typically, we focus just on the industry side. Today, I've had the pleasure of meeting Dave from MDA, uh, who you'll get to know more in, in just a minute. I swear I'm almost done. This is, uh, <laughs> you're almost done listening to me, but, uh, you know, getting more on the talent acquisition side. I, I can't emphasize enough how often I hear. So I, I'm out all the time meeting with companies and everyone is looking for good quality people right now. They can't find them. Um, you know, so being able to support, uh, you know, just, just getting the word out there. What do you need to do to get involved in the space uh, community? Because it is a community. I mean, this is, uh, uh, as the aerospace lead, you know, I've dealt with helicopters, airplanes, all the technology behind it. But you got to say the, the space people are, it, it, it's, it's a really neat community. And I'm so thrilled to, uh, to get to spend so much time with, uh, with folks in it right now. So yeah, we'll we'll do that. We um we bring people together. We promote what's happening here around the world. We'll attend events across the country and and really globally if it makes sense. And um, you know, it's uh it's really connecting and educating is is what we do here. Uh, to, to, to leverage our strategic network. So we work with everyone: industry associations, post secondary institutes, other government departments, other levels of government. Um, pretty much, it's a it, it's a complex. Uh, broad uh, community out there, and we like to uh, talk to anyone that we can. 
SMEs, big companies as well. Um, I'll quickly go, I'll quick skip over where our role is in the defense procurement, but just um, the, these will be shared with everyone after. You can sort of see how defense procurements work in Canada, starting from pre request for proposal all the way to the contract award, and then you can say we get into service support. On the other side, this can take years. Uh, so the, the big point there is that it's a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, we do have some 16 key industrial capabilities that have been identified. Uh, if you do work in these areas, there's uh, additional incentive for the OEMs and prime contractors to work with you. Um, again, this will be shared. A uh, little bit more detail here on this slide about the defense sector here in southern Ontario. I think I have covered a lot of this generally, but uh, what I do want to highlight is that you know, strengths in areas such as advanced materials, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and clean tech are real um, uh, differentiators for our region here in Southern Ontario. I'm almost done. This is our team. So I'm the, the Air and AI lead. We have Robin Horry, who's our land systems and advanced materials lead. We have Christine McKnight, who's our marine and cybersecurity lead. Uh, Shelby Iyer, who does clean tech and supports on marine. And then Ken McConnell, who tries to keep us all in line. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I think he's got the hardest job of all of us. Uh, at this point, thank you. And uh, presentation is done there. We'll be passing it over to Brian at Space Canada now. And uh, I'll just give him a second to get up on screen. And hi, Brian. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me start off by saying a big thank you for inviting me and, and obviously Space Canada, who I represent to be a part of this. A big thank you to Space Flight Laboratories, MDA, FedDev, Space Place Canada, and of course, everybody that took some time out of your busy schedules to join us. J'apprécie énormément d'être ici avec vous. Uh, je suis ravi d'avoir l'opportunité de vous parler un peu des opportunités qui se présentent uh, dans l'industrie et uh, bien sûr, prendre de vos questions. So if it's okay, I'm gonna do a quick presentation. Uh, I'm just gonna do uh, this this will be the part in which I'm going to go through everything that we are and who uh, who Space Canada is, what we do. And uh, if you all see that, I don't know if it came up. Not yet, eh? Okay, It'll be there we go. If you all see that, uh, I'll quickly go through a bit of a presentation that we do to explain who we are as an organization. So essentially we represent the Canadian space ecosystem and the word ecosystem was chosen on purpose and I'll explain that in a second. And our goal is to advance the Canadian space ecosystem to strengthen it, to have key stakeholders, obviously one of which is the government and the federal government specifically to prioritize space, to invest in space, to advance strategies, policies and regulatory frameworks that will help us ensure we have a robust, strong, and uh, a, a sector that is contributing to our daily lives. Our mission and objective, so it's pretty funny, we have five on the screen there. <laughs> I tell people we originally had four and then somebody said, you know, if you had a fifth, you could spell out the acronym SPACE. So that's exactly what we did. <laughs> so what, yeah, all, all, all honesty here. So we are looking to shape the conversation and discussion around important issues related to the space ecosystem here in Canada, promote the Canadian space sector and the ecosystem here in, 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 in the country domestically, but also across the globe, advocate for the sector and ecosystem with key stakeholders uh, here in Canada and internationally, enhance collaboration within the industry, but also with key stakeholders, and that can be domestically and across the globe, and then raise awareness and educate Canadians and key stakeholders to the benefits of space, how it can help us tackle societal and planetary challenges that worry us, how it can help advance our economy, how it can uh, provide careers uh, for people here in the country, which is obviously uh, something I look forward to chatting a little bit about with you all today. Um, and of course, w w the challenges that the ecosystem faces and how we can overcome them. So very quickly, we launched one year ago. Uh, we launched, right? Lots of puns, I'm sure, that will be uh, that will be thrown around uh, in March. And in fact, we're celebrating our, our one year anniversary this Friday. And when I had a chat with Craig, he actually remembered that our anniversary was coming up, which very much impressed me. So uh, we're going to be celebrating that Friday. So we, we started with nine founding members. And to give you a sense, since uh, our launch a year ago, we now have over 50 organizations that have joined our organization from coast to coast, which is just phenomenal. And we have 
members and associates that have joined us. And when I say that we want to work with the ecosystem and strengthen the ecosystem, we have members that are essentially businesses that do space related work in Canada. And then we have associates that may be missing one of those three criteria. So it could be an NGO that's doing work in Canada that's space related. It could be a business that isn't yet in Canada, but is interested in the market. And then they can become associate members and join our movement. We have large global companies, we have startups, academic institutions, non-for-profits, which is fantastic. And in fact, kind of cool perspective that we have around the table where 75% of our members have 100 employees or less. One of the things that I'm sure will come up a few times, at least I hope it does in our conversation, uh, Space Canada members, people that are a part and organizations that are part of the space ecosystem in our country contribute billions of dollars to the Canadian economy every single year. Uh, and including thousands of jobs uh, every single year. Our main point of advocacy is a National Space Council, so I'm going to get that out of the way right now. Um, if it comes up in the questions, great, but essentially one of the main things we'd like to see happen with the federal government would be that they create a council that would be proper and internal to government, very much akin to what the U.S. does, and we believe this would help government have a whole-of-government approach to space, uh, strengthen governance, and better coordinate all the efforts that the government already puts in. And of course, hopefully efforts that they will enhance based on new strategies and focuses uh, that would stem from this uh, organization. And my last slide, uh, my last uh, substantive slide would be other ways to engage with Space Canada. So if anybody's listening, would be interested in being a member or an associate, please reach out. But there's also other ways to engage with Space Canada if you're not in an organization that could become a member. You can attend some of our events. We have an annual conference every year. It'll be in October of this year, uh, like it was last year. We have other webinars and other roundtables that we organize. We are on all social media channels, and we also have a newsletter that you can subscribe to. I'll pause on this for two seconds, just so if anybody is interested in getting more information on our organization and what we do, or want to get more information on how to participate and engage, you can take down that email and please reach out uh, anytime. So I will now stop sharing my screen and get into sort of more of the top, the, the, the sujet du jour, the topic of the day. So one of the things that, that is interesting for us uh, as a group that is advocating for the space sector is that we're very cognizant of the fact that space plays an often invisible role. It is an enabler for our economy. It really does play a role in every uh, every every sort of aspect, every department, every everything that we hold in dear. Uh, space can help us uh, most likely uh, contri and contribute to helping advance it. So it really does play an essential role in the everyday lives of all Canadians. And the impact uh, that space can have is unfortunately sometimes misunderstood and frankly, it cannot be overstated. So a few examples from keeping millions of people connected online to helping remote, uh, rural, northern and indigenous communities be able to be connected to helping us monitor climate change and mitigate its impacts to ensuring our sovereignty and national security. Uh, and of course, to inspiring the next generation of Canadians to reach for the stars, which I think my colleague and friend uh, did a great job from Space Place Canada of explaining uh, how, how we can look to the stars to inspire our next generation. In addition to solving some of today's biggest challenges, the new space economy is expected to grow into a multi-trillion dollar sector. And this is going to drive massive economic growth, job and IP creation. There's going to be investments in R&D and innovation, uh, and it really is an opportunity to increase international exports for Canadians. Now let's get into a few numbers. So in 2019, the space sector uh, is estimated to have employed over 10,000 people. In 2023, this figure is estimated to be approximately 20,000 people. The Canadian Space Agency will be coming out with more updated numbers, so the, the, we'll see if the estimate holds true. The space sector is a high value industry as well, where we find that jobs in the sector often pay on average approximately 64% more than the Canadian average, demonstrating not only that it creates thousands of jobs, but on average creates uh, what should be considered very good paying jobs. In 2021, the global space economy was worth $370 billion. By 2030, this uh, number is expected to grow by a significant amount to approximately $640 billion. And just to be clear, both those numbers are annually. 
There are even some that go as far as saying by 2040, the industry could grow to over a trillion dollars, some saying even two trillion dollars of economic activity per year. Governments invest a lot. So just to give you a sense of some of the investments that we see around the globe by some of the major players in the space sector, the United States uh, is, is investing approximately $55 billion on an annual basis. China, approximately 10 billion. Japan, approximately 4 billion. France, approximately 4 billion as well. And Russia, approximately 3.5 billion. Canada spends roughly half a billion dollars. Uh, certainly, hopefully, in the years to come, given the importance and the strategic nature of the industry and the ecosystem, will increase those investments. And to give some people, give people a bit of a sense of where some of this growth will come from. Uh, these are estimates, of course, but it looks like a lot of the growth would come from uh, about 50% of it would come from satellite navigation, approximately 40% would come from satellite communications, 4% from Earth observation and sensing, and about 4% from defense. So these are all subsectors that we believe Canada can play a, an important role. They already are, our space innovators already do, and we believe we'll be able to play an increasingly important role moving forward especially because we have a lot of the building blocks for uh, this type of industry uh, because of the innovation, because of our post-secondary education institutions, the R&D capacity that we have, uh, et j'en passe, uh, but of course because we also have a very strong space sector in which to begin with. Now one point that I certainly want to make, and I'm going to make it now because I don't want to forget and, and hope that I get a question that can lead me to this answer. One thing that I really want to hammer home is for anybody listening that might be saying to themselves, you know, I, I wonder what the careers are going to look like moving forward for this industry. The one thing that I think, given that it is an industry that has the perception that it is very engineer focused, um, th there, of course, going to be a need for that type of uh, that type of labor, that type of workforce. But there's going to be a need for more than that. And the best example I can give you is uh, actually a related industry, but it's from cybersecurity. And it's just because it came from a professor a few years back and it always stuck with me when uh, we were working on building here in New Brunswick a, um, a, uh, a cluster in cybersecurity, a professor took me aside and said, please, please make sure that as we're investing to, to, to build this cluster, that we don't make the following mistake, that we don't think that the only type of worker that we need, the only type of person education that we need is computer scientists. He said, we're going to need, if we're going to do our job right, we need people that are in the human sciences, we need philosophers, we need people that are in political science, we need obviously business majors, we need all these other types of, of education uh, to play a role. And, and it's the same thing for the space sector. And by the way, space and cyber are quite interlinked. We wrote uh, as an organization a paper on that not too, uh, just a few weeks ago. So check it out if you had the chance. Um, but really it is important to communicate that, uh, yeah, a lot of engineers are gonna be needed, but there's gonna be a lot more than that. And especially since obviously there's lots of economic opportunity that will then sort of um, have ripple effects in different sectors, but also because the functions in which space is being utilized, the commercialization of space, the accessibility of space that is really opening up, all of these things are going to mean that there's going to be different things coming from uh, that industry and, and things that we can project in the years to come will change, sure, but there's gonna be things in decades to come that we can't even predict right now. So if you are interested in the sector, you are inter interested in space, uh, and but maybe engineering is not for you, there are definitely other ways in which you'll be able to contribute to this ecosystem and to this industry. Merci beaucoup encore pour l'invitation. I look forward to hearing the other presenters and of course, very much look forward to taking any questions you may have. Thanks so much, Brian. Sorry, we had a little uh, second there uh, to unmute ourselves in the room here. So uh, merci beaucoup. I that thought was, uh, what's okay. I thought you were about to say we didn't hear any of your presentation. Could you do it again? So no, I'm, I'm happy that's yeah. <laughs> <All good. laughs> no, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if that happens today. The way things have been going, but no, I think you came through <laughs> loud and clear for everyone. It's wonderful. Probably bouncing the signal off a few satellites to keep it going <laughs> and all of that. Exactly. But uh, you know, excellent point on you know it's not just engineers. Uh, you know, for people like myself that, you know, I've, it's probably, you know, it's, I, I wasn't, didn't go to school for engineering, but love the sector, love space, and it's, there's so many exciting things that are happening. And, you know, taking that broader look at, at, at how you can contribute to 
and and really look, take advantage and, and get exploit these opportunities that are going to be out there with this you know very quickly growing sector uh wonderful point there and uh you know, you're, I, I know that Space Canada, your, your goal is really to uh, to get the government of Canada behind you. I, I don't speak for the entire government, but you've got one big advocate here uh, <laughs> sitting right in front of you. So excellent there. So we'll uh, we'll throw it over to uh, Dr. Robert Z now at uh, Space Flight Labs. And uh, he's going to talk to us in the laboratory, sorry, and will speak to us about what uh, what they do there. But uh, yeah, I no, look forward to uh, talking more, Brian, at the uh, at the Q&A. I do, just before I throw it over to you, Rob, I do want to mention I'm seeing some good questions come through the live event Q&A, so thank you for folks who have been putting those in. Um, we're getting them and we'll be publishing them a little later on as we get into the Q&A section, but please please keep those coming. So uh, Dr. Z, over, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Craig. Uh, let me just bring up my presentation. Can everyone see my presentation okay? Good. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for um, being here today and giving me the opportunity to, to speak to you um, about what we're doing at the Space Flight Laboratory, or SFL. We've been around for about... Sorry, I was muted there for a second. Can everyone hear me now? OK, um, so we've been around for about 25 years now, and uh, we've been developing space missions for um, clients around the world. And I guess I'm here today to talk about opportunities in space, specifically those enabled by the Space Flight Laboratory. And we're all about enabling these opportunities, enabling others to do great things in space. Sorry, I'm struggling with the mute. Every time I hit enter, I get muted, so I'm going to avoid doing that. Um, so for those of you who don't know us, um, SFL is uh, a worldwide um, developer of low-cost missions. And so this graphic illustrates the various countries that we've delivered satellites or space technology to. Um, we have quite a track record. We're uh, an industry leader in the small satellite industry, and we develop so-called nano, micro, and small satellites uh, for clients around the world. These are satellites ranging from three to 500 kilograms, um, and these are delivered at a, at a fraction of the traditional or typical price relative to the performance and quality. Uh, we're an experienced group um, in our 25-year history. We have launched 64 distinct satellites, and we have 28 more that are currently under construction or launching soon. For all the satellites that we have on orbit now, um, we have accumulated over 230 years of on-orbit heritage. So these are professional grade satellites. We're part of the University of Toronto. We're a specialty lab at the University of Toronto, but these are not uh, you know, student CubeSats or um, satellites simply for education. We have a full-time staff of about 60 uh, professionals along with about 20 graduate students at any given time. One way to think about us is we're, we're akin to a teaching hospital in the space industry. And so if you think about teaching hospitals, they deliver professional services, but I, they also bring up the next generation. They have interns and residents that study side by side with uh, people that have been practicing for a long time. And so that's how we are at SFL and we use the teaching hospital model. Um, we believe that we offer best value in the industry and in that given the performance and quality of the space missions we deliver, um, you know, we uh, we deliver them at substantially lower cost than one would expect. And so great value. Uh, we push the envelope of what smaller satellites can do. And so our philosophy is to build the smallest spacecraft possible for a given mission. Um, so we challenge the state of the art. We try to expand the application space that is served by smaller spacecraft and, um, you know, encroach upon the application space that is currently occupied by larger satellites. Obviously, you can't do everything uh, with a smaller satellite that you can do with a large satellite. You have to obey the laws of physics, 
Um, but with advances in microelectronics and instrumentation, um, there's a lot more that you can do today that you couldn't do yesterday. And so we're all about enabling opportunities, like I said earlier. Uh, our motto is smaller satellites, bigger return. And what I mean by bigger return is, um, you know, either commercial uh, economic returns or uh, scientific returns or educational returns. And so we service all three sectors. On the commercial side, we help companies and startups get into space to help them to exploit space, to help them to realize their business models. Um, and so we help them by offloading a lot of uh, the daunting responsibility associated with uh, operating a space mission and utilizing space. So it allows companies to exploit space, to operate from space, deliver data from space without necessarily becoming an expert in developing spacecraft, for example. Really companies that try to do both um, are kind of limited in that they're trying to run two businesses within a single company. So uh, startups, new space companies that are just getting into the business that want to deliver services from space can count on SFL as, as an expert partner in developing um, satellite, satellite designs and helping to set up production. And so our, our typical approach is that we will design and build the first satellite or first few satellites in a constellation and then help the, the company with production, whether they want to do it in-house, whether they want to outsource it, whether they want SFL to help them with that. We also assist government. And so this is not just national government, but also governments around the world. Um, the, the goal here is to enable more missions under national control, and that gives government tasking authority and a certain amount of independence, uh, not relying on other nations and, and having to task assets from other nations. It also allows smaller government departments to have their own space missions, uh, which is which is really intriguing. So instead of just having a space agency do all uh, the missions going forward, you can think about other government departments with a specific need being able to uh, have their own low cost space mission. And in the end, this will enable more space assets and infrastructure in space on constrained budgets that you typically find in, in government. We also support academia and research institutions, and so we enable science and technology demonstration missions, and these science and technology demonstration missions typically have very limited funding, and so it's very important that we design to cost. Uh, and again, we enable independence in tasking and mission control. Uh, we, um, we enable science return, great science return on shorter schedules, and, and principal investigators and their co-investigators can have easier access to data uh, being in control of their own spacecraft. And last but not least, we also train highly qualified personnel, uh, that teaching hospital model that I referred to earlier. This graphic illustrates um, the spacecraft that we have launched to date. And um, let me just get my laser pointer here. Um, so it's a mixture of commercial, government, and scientific or academic missions. Um, I guess this region here is our commercial missions over here we have some government missions and down below we have some uh, scientific missions um, so we help companies like hawkeye 360 in the united states company in virginia delivering uh, rf geolocation services analytics associated with rf geolocation and they launch in clusters of three formation flying satellites so far we've launched six clusters for them these are 30 kilogram spacecraft we also help other companies like GHGSAT in Canada deliver global greenhouse gas monitoring and detection services. Uh, and we've launched um, quite a few satellites for them already, six so far, another three are launching soon. Uh, we've uh, collaborated with Kepler Communications as well in their Generation 1 constellation for communications. We've done other communication satellites uh, with partners, including LEO2, um, and we've also worked with Comdev and helped them to start the exact Earth business for ship detection. Uh, we have um, done quite a few satellites for the government of Norway uh, over, over here on the right, including some smaller ship detection satellites and the so-called Norsats, which involve ship detection, but also have some experimental payloads and scientific payloads. Um, we've also done a mission for 
the Dubai Space Center, MBRSC, in the UAE called DMSAT-1 for aerosol monitoring. And so that's related to environmental monitoring as well. And we've done some scientific space astronomy satellites like Bright Constellation with seven kilogram spacecraft. Um, and also the most microsatellite was our very first spacecraft as Canadian Space Agency mission. And there's been smaller technology demonstration missions as well, most notably the Canx 4 and 5 uh, precise autonomous formation flying mission that we completed in 2014, which has created an enabling technology, commercially affordable formation flying technology that is used uh, in missions like Hawkeye 360, for example. So we do Earth observation missions like NEMO HD, communication missions, monitoring surveillance missions, scientific missions, all kinds of missions for different sectors. Upcoming missions include um, more of, uh, of the same. We have NEMO AM, which is a sister satellite to DMSAT-1, aerosol monitoring for uh, the government of India, more greenhouse gas monitoring satellites for GHGSAT. Uh, Norwegian Space Agency has two more satellites coming up, um, NORSAT-4 and NORSAT-TD technology demonstration, but also uh, advanced ship tracking techniques. Another communication satellite for high frequency communication, more Hawkeye 360 spacecraft. Uh, we're also working on a couple of satellites um, that are funded from the NASA Astrophysics Pioneers Program. One satellite called Aspera uh, for the University of Arizona uh, is studying the evolution of galaxies. Starburst is a 300 kilogram spacecraft that we're doing for Marshall Space Flight Center uh, that will study or detect gamma ray bursts from neutron star mergers. So very interesting astrophysics being done in these two missions. Uh, we're also doing a mission called Grade J for DRDC, Defense R&D Canada. It's a surveillance demonstration mission, taking advantage of our formation flying capabilities. And of course, we're continuing to support Kepler in their Gen 1 constellation. So we have various platforms. Um, this just illustrates that we have uh, full capability from three kilograms all the way up to 500 kilograms. On the left here, we have our high performance CubeSats. Uh, in the middle, we have smaller microsatellites. And on the right, we have large microsatellites or small, sa small satellites uh, for various applications and different sizes of instrument. Um, so one thing to note about all of our technology is we use the same core avionics and attitude control and formation technology uh, for all of our missions. Uh, and we customize the structure, the thermal, uh, subsystems for each mission. We scale up the power and the attitude control actuators, for example, as necessary. So every every client of ours can rely upon heritage technology. We also uh, arrange launches, launches, so we deliver full missions to our, our customers and clients. And so we have good working relationships with customers around the world, uh, with sorry, with launch providers around the world. Uh, and we've launched on many different uh, vehicles to date. Uh, and we continue to arrange launches to interesting orbits as our, our clients need. Um, we're able to do ride share or dedicated launches. And so uh, it can be as carefree as our client needs it to be. We also have a mission control center uh, in Toronto and our uh, building in, in uh, Toronto. And so this illustrates our mission control center with our our screens and, and our software. We have a core suite of software that helps us to monitor health of our uh, spacecraft. We also have custom applications for each mission, depending on the payload and the concept of operations. We've helped set up ground stations around the world that we can network together with our mission control center. And we can set up mission control centers at client locations as well. Lately, there's been a lot of interest in commercial ground station networks like KSAT Light, AWS, and others. And so we have the ability to use those as well. And something about New Space, uh, I'll say something about New Space. New Space is, is a new model of um, operating in space, and really it's a commercial model. Uh, there's been a lot of different definitions of New Space, but the definition that I like to use is uh, the delivery of space based services while bringing satellite or spacecraft production in-house to reduce overall costs and, and for cost efficiency. And so we help companies, uh, new st so startups and new space companies, 
uh, get into space more easily. Uh, it's difficult to start up two, two different businesses, delivering services and also manufacturing satellites. So relying upon SFL's microspace expertise or ability to deliver low cost space solutions uh, is often a very smart thing to do. Um, so uh, we can design and develop a spacecraft and also modify and upgrade spacecraft as needed for our clients while helping them with uh, their mass production goals, however they want to do that. And there are different ways that they could produce their constellation. Uh, they could have SFL build all the spacecraft. Um, this works well if it's in the tens of spacecraft. If there's quite a number of spacecraft, a large number, then uh, you know we can do the first spacecraft and have uh, a party, a third party mass manufacture the rest if the customer doesn't want to get involved in uh, manufacturing. If the customer does want to get involved in, in production or manufacturing, uh, they can you know, be involved in spacecraft integration in a couple of ways, either integrating platforms to payloads or uh, integrating complete spacecraft um, at their facility uh, while SFL provides units for them. So, you know, new space companies should consider having SFL as a partner. We're all about enabling uh, this this commercial activity, uh, and uh, and so please do get in contact with us if you have an interest. Uh, for education, uh, for academics, we also um, offer a really world class graduate student training program, and so students, graduate students, participate directly in our missions. It's not like a typical university CubeSat program. Uh, in our case, we have graduate students joining professional teams comprised of staff and students. So students work side by side with uh, professionals that know uh, a lot about spacecraft development. And so it's like a, an apprenticeship or in like, a, like an internship, a hands on internship under uh, the mentorship of top spacecraft engineers. Um, so it's really uh, an intense program and students can uh, specialize in different technical areas, different subsystem areas and be exposed to all aspects of spacecraft design within the time it takes to complete a graduate degree. Um, so they, they experience the complete development cycle and I've had a lot of comments saying that, you know, that experience has been very beneficial to their careers. The students can also work on multiple missions. So the missions that I mentioned before, uh, in, in many cases, students get to work on uh, different missions and not just um, one mission and one subsystem. So really, in terms of breadth of experience, uh, they can get a lot out of the SFL program. And the program opens a lot of doors to our graduates. I, I can happily say that our graduates have had no difficulty finding jobs in the space industry. Uh, they've also gone on to pursue academic careers if they so desire, getting PhDs and and uh, becoming professors uh, if that's their chosen career path. So SFL has been really good at, at educating the next generation of um, spacecraft engineers. Uh, many students typically want to stay at SFL following graduation and so uh, you know, we've been hiring some of our own students as well. More information about our training program can be found on our website, utias-sfl.net, um, and the application process can be found at utias.utoronto.ca. So in summary, we deliver bigger returns from smaller spacecraft, and we're all about lowering uh, the entry barrier to companies, government, uh, research institutions around the world. Uh, our missions are highly capable at a fraction of the traditional cost. Uh, we span three to 500 kilograms in spacecraft mass, so from nano, micro to small. Uh, we service all three sectors, as I mentioned before, uh, and we're all about enabling new businesses, uh, new applications, uh, commercial exploitation, and su successful business models. Uh, you know, having a low cost uh, constellation, I think, is very important to ensuring business success and we have different production approaches that can be adapted to uh, any particular company need business model need and uh, our track record speaks for itself we've had over 230 years of on orbit heritage many success stories many commercial success stories many government success stories uh, many um, research scientific success stories and uh, we look forward to doing more in the future so that's uh, that's the end of my talk. I appreciate your taking the time to listen to me.
this afternoon, and I'll be happy to answer questions later. Awesome. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Z. That was great. And uh, judging by the comments that were coming or the questions that were coming in as you were speaking, you've uh, you hit on a few things of, uh, of interest to the audience. So looking forward to, to getting to those during the, the Q&A in about uh, 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, next up, we're going to have um, MDA uh, talk a little bit about, uh, well, about two things. We're going to have Dave, Dave Mann, who is the director of talent acquisition, speaking about working for MDA, uh, what that's like, the whole experience, the company, and he'll be joined by, um, by Laurie Chappell, who has a, who will be talking a bit more on the the technical side, the supply chain side, about what uh, what the company is looking for from that perspective. So, uh, really excited to hear what they what what they have to say, and I uh, will not delay any more and uh, pass it over to you, Dave. So let me get your presentation sharing, and uh, just feel free to start introducing yourself, and we'll we'll catch up with the presentation. Okay, so uh, we start with the video. So. <laughs> Uh, so thank you, thank you very much for uh, having us here today. This is uh, this is very exciting for us. Uh, you, you know, uh, both uh, Brian and Dr. Z talked uh, a lot about what's happening in the space industry in general, and I think uh, you know there's no doubt that Canada is is leading the charge and and that we're doing uh, great things. Before I say too much more, I just wanted to start with a quick video uh, that that talks a little bit about what uh, MDA is doing. Okay, so I, I, I just learned that there's a few people that are just on the phone, so uh, apologies because I've got a few videos here, so uh, hopefully the, the, the audio will be enough to keep you uh, engaged through that. Uh, uh, so, so as we've heard, the space industry is, is thriving. It's, it's probably the most exciting time in the history of space right now. Uh, Canada is taking uh, a leading role in that. Um, and, and according to CSA's uh, 2000, 2020 State of the Canadian Space Sector Report, uh, there's a couple of areas that Canada is really leading the charge. Um, we're leading in satellite communications, we're leading in robotics, and we're leading in remote sensing technologies. Guess what? Those are all three places that MDA thrives in. Um, so, uh, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about what NDA does and, and what our three lines of business do. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about legacy, right? So um, I, I think NDA is a, a great place to. Oh, I'm not sure what happened there. Yeah. Okay. 
NDA is a great place to uh, to build a legacy, and I want to I want to just start with one question. Um, imagine for a moment that one of your parents, your grandparents, uh, were part of the historic Apollo missions uh, that that saw Neil Armstrong take mankind's first steps on the moon. Um, would their involvement in that program become part of their legacy, part of your family's legacy? Uh, I, I suggest the answer to that is yes. And and you know, just judging by all the people that have talked to me about you know their uncle or their neighbor or you know uh, their grandfather that was involved in Canada Arm One or even Canada Arm Two, you know, I would say being involved in something like that uh, is is really historic and and becomes part of the legacy. Uh, it's really not often that we get the chance to be uh, part of something historic and, and uh, part of something that, that will build your legacy. And, and I would argue that the work that lies ahead of us uh, with Artemis and, and future missions uh, uh, going to Mars eventually uh, will make the, the work that Neil Armstrong did uh, pale in comparison. So who's MDA? I'm not going to bore you with our, our history. We've been around for a long time, uh, founded in, in 1969. Um, but uh, there, there's a few things that um, I, I did want to talk about. We've been part of the technology fabric of, of uh, Canada for a, a long time. Uh, as of three years ago, we are now once again uh, fully Canadian uh, operated. Ooh. And as of, two, yeah. <laughs> And as of two years ago, we're now traded on the uh, Toronto Stock Exchange. Um, we've been involved in many historic programs, and and many of those have been memorialized. Uh, you can see here uh, the Canadian five dollar bill. Uh, I show that to uh, uh, thousands of people. It's it's my obnoxious business card um, that that has Canada M2 on it, as as well as Dexter, the um, the uh, end manipulator uh, for Canada M2. Uh, and and uh, we we're on the old hundred dollar bill, uh, and and we've been uh, on many uh, uh, stamps and, and other um, you know memorabilia. Memorabilia. We have three lines of business. Uh, we've got our robotics and space operations uh, that's based out of Brampton uh, with the uh, um, satellite offices in uh, Ottawa as well as um, uh, uh, Houston. Uh, we've got our geointelligence uh, business uh, based out of Richmond, BC, with uh, some operations in, in Halifax uh, and Ottawa as well. And we've got our satellite systems business, which is based out of our Montreal, St. Anne de Bellevue uh, facility. And I'll get into a little bit more about what each of those do. Uh, we'll start with geointelligence, uh, starting out on the West Coast. Um, they're, like I said, they're based in, in Richmond, BC, with operations in Ottawa and Halifax as well as uh, we were embedded in a couple of uh, uh, customer sites, including the Canadian Space Agency. Um, they, they, they really, uh, their business is um, driving insights out of data. Um, you know, uh, and, and that's data coming from our own satellites on orbit, as well as our customers. Um, we're also working to make the world a safer place. Uh, by things like stamping out illegal fishing and smuggling and human trafficking through our, our dark vessel detection program, where we, we essentially cross-reference transponder data with uh, our synthetic aperture radar data to identify ships that are running dark uh, without their transponders turned on. Uh, we're also using data to monitor protected forests where we're able to identify the loss of a single tree in, in a thousand hectare forest in order to combat illegal uh, logging and forestry. Um, let's watch a quick video about some of the things that we do in geointelligence. Will? Sorry, technical difficulties here. In December 2007, Canada's Earth observation satellite, RadarSat-2, was launched into space. Capable of scanning the Earth at all times, day or night, through any weather conditions, the satellite typically acquires more than 30,000 images a year. These images are used by research centers, private industries, and government departments and agencies across the country and around the world. The information they provide is used for a vast array of applications, from helping monitor fishing activities on our coasts to increasing our agriculture's profitability and sustainability. 
Radar Sat 2 technology can be used to monitor landslide risks along strategic transportation and energy corridors, giving our country the means to better protect critical infrastructures. Because it delivers data in near real time, its images are also used to help coordinate rescue teams on the ground following natural disasters, making Radar Sat 2 an essential tool where lives, communities, and the environment are at stake. Radar Set 2 collects critical information on remote or inaccessible areas, helping ships navigate safely through Canadian waters and enabling northern communities to plan safer routes for fishing and hunting expeditions. Space technologies developed for satellites bring new solutions to Earth challenges. The Canadian Space Agency is committed to fostering innovation for the benefit of all Canadians. Canadian Space Agency, thinking outside of the globe. So some of the roles that we uh, look for in geointelligence, uh, you know, very focused on software. Uh, uh, we've got various different languages that we're uh, recruiting for their program managers, uh, uh, analysts, technicians and operators. Um, as, as Brian said, there are a lot of non-technical roles as well, uh, you know, whether it's procurement, uh, legal, we've got uh, a, a huge uh, amount of hiring that we're doing in the legal uh, world right now. So uh, certainly uh, there are, well, the, the bulk of our hiring tends to be engineering. Um, and, and sometimes the amount of engineering hiring we're doing dwarfs the other hiring. There's, there's a lot of hiring that we do that, that is non-technical as well. Uh, satellite systems. This is based in St. Anne de Bellevue in the Montreal area, West Island. Um, and in uh, satellite systems, we are, uh, we're, we're, um, we're radically changing the way the world communicates. Uh, we're building multiple satellite constellations that will provide high speed, low latency broadband communication anywhere in the world. And we're no longer going to be tethered to cell phone towers bring up the way we communicate, communicate with the rest of the world, uh, anywhere that we may be. Uh, we've also built out a state-of-the-art Industry 4.0 manufacturing facility in Montreal, and it's capable of developing the most advanced satellite payloads in the world. Let's take a look at that. Just say that if you ever get the chance to tour our Montreal uh, facility, it's one of the uh, most exciting tours that I've ever been on. It's uh, it's really uh, awe inspiring. So, uh, in Montreal, we actually have over 200 uh, roles, actually close to 250 open roles right now, and it, that's all fueled by the growth in in the Constellation satellite uh, programs that we're uh, that we're delivering. Uh, those roles include uh, a lot of software, again, especially embedded software, uh, RF. 
um, electrical um, um, and, and uh, program management. As, as in, in Montreal, we tend to uh, start with the design phase, which is heavily engineering focused. And then as we come out of the design phase, we pivot to uh, a manufacturing phase. So we've got several programs now that are in that pivot stage. So we're really starting to ramp up our technicians, technologists, um, assembly uh, type of roles. We also have, um, again, to Brian's point, lots of procurement, lots of contracts, uh, types of roles, uh, finance, uh, all, all kinds of roles that are non-engineering uh, as well. And last but not least, uh, I want to talk a little bit about our uh, robotics and space operations business. So, you know, there's been a lot of talk about Canon RM3, and this is where Canon RM3 uh, comes from. Um, you know, we're uh, it's it's where the iconic Canon RM1 and 2 uh, were developed and and uh, built and maintained. Um, and and currently, we we maintain Canon RM2 to this day. Um, as as we've talked about, uh, we've, we've developed CanArm3 that's going to go on the gateway that will orbit the moon, uh, part of the Artemis programs uh, that will see many historic firsts. Um, because of this contribution to the Artemis program, Canada is going to have an astronaut on the first uh, crewed mission, Artemis 2, that's going to launch in 2024. Uh, and, and that's just next year. It just blows me away every time I think that's just okay. next year. Um, the, the program will also see the first female and the first person of color uh, on the surface of the moon. Uh, and that's going to be on Artemis 3, uh, which is slated for 2025. Um, we, our Artemis missions will also set the record for the farthest humans away from uh, the, uh, the planet Earth uh, because of the unique elliptical halo orbit that uh, you're going to see a little bit more about in a second. Um, so let's watch a quick video about the Artemis missions. Between 1968 and 1972, America launched nine human missions to the moon, six of which successfully touched down, allowing 12 men to walk on the lunar surface. NASA's next chapter of lunar exploration, called Artemis, has the task of not just going to the moon to create a long-term human presence on and around it, but also to prepare for ever more complex human missions to Mars. In short, everything we must be able to do here we must first do here. So, what will an Artemis mission look like? Everything is designed and tested with our most important element in mind, the astronauts. This is their deep space, human-rated spacecraft called Orion, built in three parts. The crew module, where up to four astronauts will live and work throughout the flight. The service module, with life support systems for the crew and its own engine and fuel reserves. And a launch abort system, with engines capable of pulling the crew module to safety during launch should anything go wrong. To accomplish the task of launching our crew in heavy payloads, NASA is building the Space Launch System, comprising of a cargo hold, an exploration upper stage, a massive core stage, and two extended solid rocket boosters. Altogether, this is the world's most powerful rocket, and it exceeds the legendary Saturn V of the Apollo era in numerous ways. Sitting on the launch pad, the entire rocket, fully fueled, weighs just over 6 million pounds, 5.2 million of which is just the fuel. Once ignited, there is no stopping what comes next. All four RS-25 engines and the two solid rocket boosters come to life, thundering our crew upwards. Two minutes after ignition, the solid rocket boosters are spent and released. Eight minutes after launch, the core stage is depleted and separated. The upper stage fires briefly, placing Orion into a parking orbit around the Earth. Here, the crew reconfigure the spacecraft and check systems to confirm everything is ready for deep space travel. With a go from mission control, the crew reignite the exploration upper stage engines to leave Earth entirely. The exact timing of this maneuver is critical to reach a speed that can escape Earth's gravitational pull, but also put Orion on a course that will intersect the moon days later. Once this burn is complete, the upper stage of the SLS is jettisoned and the crew aboard Orion coast for several days toward all that awaits them at the moon. Approaching the moon, we see the fundamental differences between Artemis and Apollo. Instead of requiring Orion to serve as an expendable lunar command module or to carry a constrained lunar lander, the Artemis missions will take advantage of a different approach, pre-staging. Everything needed for lunar missions will be positioned in advance by commercial and international partners. This includes rovers, science experiments, and human-rated systems on the surface. 
also includes a dedicated lunar station in orbit around the moon called Gateway. Here at the station, we can pre-stage a robust lunar lander and establish a strong communications relay. Designed with open standards, the Gateway can be expanded as new missions and partnerships develop, allowing multiple human missions on the moon at the same time and enabling ongoing science to be conducted even between human missions. The Gateway is also capable of adjusting its orbit to allow access to every part of the moon, something the Apollo missions could not do. But the real key in this approach is placing Gateway in a unique halo orbit to perfect the maneuvers needed for Mars missions. And with the growing list of commercial and international opportunities, Gateway is the ideal hub between Earth and all that lies beyond. Returning to our crew as they approach Gateway, the Orion must match the elliptical orbit of the station in order to successfully dock. Once on board, pre-selected crew members transfer to the lunar lander, while those assigned to Gateway remain on station. The lunar lander system itself is built for three unique steps. Descending from the halo orbit of Gateway down to a low lunar orbit, descending from low lunar orbit to the surface, and once the lunar mission is complete, launching from the surface of the moon and ascending all the way back to the orbiting gateway. Once back aboard the Orion spacecraft and undocked from gateway, the crew fire their engine once to break out of the halo orbit and once again to sling the spacecraft around the moon, placing it on a multi-day trajectory back towards Earth. As they near the end of this journey, the service module is released All right, so that's a little bit about the um, the, the Artemis program and uh, the, the 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 gateway that uh, that they talked about is going to be uh, launched, I believe, in Artemis four and Artemis five. So uh, um, and and that's where MDA is really going to uh, make its uh, its its, uh, its mark. Uh, oh, I'm um, I'm I, I'm going to skip over. We got. Um, uh, a, a quick little video here about uh, our new facility that uh, we're opening this year in Brampton that's going to be the uh, Center of uh, Robotic Operations. Um, uh, it's going to have uh, several mission control centers and uh, it's also going to be our, our corporate head office. Uh, uh, it's going to be state of the art, but uh, I would encourage you to uh, find that video on, on YouTube and take a look at it. A couple of the roles that we, we look for here, uh, Various engineering disciplines, uh, electrical, mechanical software, quality and mission assurance, uh, program management roles, procurement contracts. Um, and then as again, as we move into the latter stages of C3, we're going to be uh, moving into the uh, manufacturing stages and that's going to require more technician technologist roles. I'm going to uh, turn it over to Lori right now to talk a little bit more about uh, uh, what we're doing on the Canada Arm 3 program. Sure. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Canon Arm 3 is the next generation AI enabled robot. That's Canada's contribution to the Gateway. So as you saw in the video, the Gateway is an important part of NASA's Artemis program. It's basically a multi-purpose outpost that orbits the moon and supports the long-term human return to the lunar surface, and then also serves as a staging point for deep space exploration. Next slide. Uh, so what are the objectives of this program? Like, why are we doing it? So first, as Dave mentioned, working with international partners to deliver Artemis, which is humanity's return to the moon and gives Canada the opportunity for the, the astronaut flight. Creating uh, Canadian industrial capabilities in the space sector is important. Uh, positioning Canadian industry to compete in new markets uh, beyond the uh, beyond Canada Arm 3 and then fostering innovation and spin-off technologies. So on the next slide, you can see a um, pretty uh, high level picture of the uh, Canada Arm 3 or the Gateway External Robotics System. It basically uh, includes two manipulators, a, a very large arm for positioning modules and visiting vehicles, and then a dexterous arm for handling smaller payloads and specialized tools. What you can't see in this picture is that Canada Arm 3 will be a significant step forward in terms of autonomy. So um, this uh, increased level of autonomy will enable operations to be done with fewer people and with a, a uh, basically a limited communications pipeline. So 
Next slide shows uh, the robotics uh, flight system, which uh, has a few more details on uh, what Canada needs to provide. Uh, the, the flight system is the Canada Arm 3 elements that are in space. So the large arm XLA, the dexterous arm XDA, various interfaces, tools, and support equipment. And then the next slide shows the, the ground se segment. So ground segment is the part that's on Earth. And as Dave mentioned, we're, we're creating a new facility uh, here in Brampton that will um, be the place from where all the Canadarm3 uh, operations are controlled. So that's, uh, that's an exciting new capability for us. The next slide shows the Artemis timeline. So um, down in the bottom right there, you see the uh, gateway external robotic system, the little robot. So this shows the uh, buildup of the uh, Artemis capabilities and when the, um, the gateway external robotic system will be added to the gateway and then we'll start the operations from our new facility. Um, Thinking about what's what's beyond that or what are there other opportunities, the uh, next slide shows the commercialization opportunities. So how can we commercialize the technology that Canada is developing for Artemis? We don't want to just build one robotic arm and then do nothing else. So uh, on this slide, you see the commercial LEO stations. Uh, these are being developed now and they'll come online as the ISS the International Space Station retires at the end of the decade. So. With any station, robotics uh, will play a key role in the operation of the station. So these stations are prime opportunities for robotics commercialization. And then uh, the next slide shows a, a longer timeline. You can see in the upper corner the International Space Station and the commercial LEO uh, stations uh, flowing into the, the gateway, the station around the moon. But um, beyond that, the sustained presence on the lunar surface, sustained human presence on the lunar surface, and then Mars, um, there'll be a need for a lot of robotic capabilities to create and maintain the infrastructure on the lunar and Martian surface. And that's uh, uh, robotic robotic arms and uh, mobility platforms and uh, other things like that. So um, in a nutshell, C3 is just the start of a number of exciting opportunities going forward. So with that, I'll pass it back to Dave. Okay. Uh, I talked a little bit about uh, careers at MDA, but I also want to talk about uh, the vendors on the line who are interested in, in uh, working with MDA. And we've developed our MDA launch pads that, you can, uh, uh, that can be assessed at mda.space forward slash mda dash launch pad. Uh, and that's a, a portal for uh, vendors who are interested in, in uh, working with us to uh, find out more to uh, to engage with us and you know to potentially uh, do more business with us. Uh, so so that opportunity to build your legacy doesn't just apply to uh, our employees; it applies to our partners as well. Uh, the one thing I will point out is that these programs are long term. Um, you know, even when there is a fit there, sometimes it's a it's a long term uh, process to get uh, to become a, a an MBA vendor. As with you know, uh, many uh, uh, programs like this. So uh, to wrap up, uh, you know, uh, the work that we're doing is stuff that we're all going to be telling our grandkids about and they're going to be telling their kids about. Uh, and, and um, you know, th this is really a very unique opportunity for, for uh, employees and potentially vendors to come and join and build a lasting legacy, uh, both for Canada and for themselves. Excellent. Well, <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Dave and Lori. That's uh, that was great. You know, and and I, I for one, am really excited about all the opportunities coming out of you know all the great work that uh, is coming out around Canada Arm Three and all the new space. Thank you for saving the water stills. <laughs> Amazing. See, we look out for each other here. Uh, this is great. So, um, no, I, I thought that was great and I really appreciate it. I mean, one <clears throat> one thing I wanted to mention is that uh, I was talking a little about Canada's ITB policy, the Industrial and Technological Benefits Policy, in the context of defense projects. Uh, interestingly, Canada has decided to apply this requirement to the Canada Arm 3 project as well. So, this is one where we're going to need 100% Canadian content value. 
at the end of the day uh, from MDA and you know it further incentivizes the company MDA to to find more Canadian uh, innovative Canadian partners to to get the work done. So um, you know I think it's great we've got the launch pad out there so people can get in touch with you through that. Um, anyone wants to reach out through me as well, I'm happy to help uh, you know connect you into MDA. But uh, at this point, I'll ask uh, you know our presenters to all throw their cameras back on, and we're going to go through some of the uh, some of the questions we have here for a few minutes. Um, I know we're scheduled to be done in, in about five minutes, but uh, if everyone's okay going a couple minutes long, I think there's some some good questions on here that uh, you know here's here's a quick one. Uh, around the slides and the recording. Both will be distributed afterwards. Uh, when you signed up, um, hopefully you put in an email address that will allow you to receive those. So we'll be following up those in the in the coming days. Uh, there's my answer. <laughs> the other people are going to have to answer the other ones. We've got some, we've got some tough ones there. Um, so just looking through what uh, all the questions that we received here, the, the first one, and maybe I'll um, you know, Brian, we haven't heard from you in a while. So, uh, if you're if you're still here, we'd like to uh, throw it this way. So, um, it's a question here from from Nikolai, who was on the line about the National Space Council and how it will work in the presence of the uh, the Canadian Space Agency. Uh, I guess what uh, what folks are what what Nikolai is really looking for there is what's uh, what's the big differentiator there between this this council and, and the existing CSA. Yeah, thanks. My pleasure to answer. I, well, let me start by saying the Canadian Space Agency does fantastic work. Uh, the challenge, however, is that when the Canadian Space Agency was set up, much like many of the space agencies around the world, the role of government and how it would enable all the efforts that we were doing in space was a lot different. I mean, government still plays a very important role, a pivotal role uh, today and, and will play a very important role moving forward, but the role has changed and it's not the only kind of player in town as it may have been in the first years of uh, space exploration and some of the things we were doing with regards to the space sector. So so the, the dynamic has changed immensely over the last few decades and I, I've, I've been in government. I know that it's hard for, for any large organization, especially governments, that have you know important bureaucracy, bureaucracy that helps ensure that there's accountability and transparency, and that there's good, uh, the best possible decision-making process possible. But but nevertheless, bureaucracy that can take time. So when you have an industry, when you have something that is emerging, that is changing, the functions in which you're using that that thing uh, is changing before your eyes. It's hard to keep up if you're a nimble organization, let alone a large organization, let alone an organization with tons of departments. So the Canadian Space Agency, in relation to how we would see a National Space Council function, uh, they, they should be a part of it. I mean, they should definitely be right in the middle of it. And, and other departments like I said and defense, uh, transport, uh, the uh, global affairs uh, and, and climate change, environment and climate change, I mean, and the list could go on, um, should be playing a role as well. And what we're a little worried about is that without that type of kind of body, uh, it, it will be very easy for a large organization, so in this case, the federal government, to maybe not be able to get together and get things done that will require a lot of departments playing a role. And I'll, I'll finish with this example. Transport Canada uh, had made an announcement uh, in January, I believe, so about a month ago, let's say, and essentially was announcing how it was going to deal with commercial space launch applications. And what's, what's really interesting is that obviously when we think of the federal government in space, very normal for us to think about the Canadian Space Agency first, but that's a huge announcement and it came from transport. It's, it's a big deal. It'll make a, a, an impact on the Canadian space ecosystem and it came from transport. And then to further the example, Transport Canada themselves very, very smartly acknowledged we're going to be accepting applications on a case by case basis for those that would like to do commercial space launch in Canada. And we're going to have to work with all these different departments that have a role to play in determining if we should accept a, a, an application or not. So it was it, the right thing to do for sure, but it was just a demonstration 
at least for us, that there is a need for that holistic approach, whole of government approach. And, and not only will it lead to better decision making, we think it'll make us quicker, more nimble, and of course, help us realize that a lot of departments will play a role in advancing the Canadian space ecosystem. And a lot of departments will benefit from what the Canadian space ecosystem can do. So to me, CSA would be right at the heart of the National Space Council, and I would hope the council would help prioritize space, which would obviously be a great benefit to the CSA. Excellent, Brian. Thank you. And this is uh, this is sort of continuing the theme from before, right? That these different areas that we may not traditionally think of as space really are impacted by space and impact space and are are relevant now, just with all of all of these you know wide ranging opportunities that that we're seeing now. So that was uh, excellent. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to go back to uh, the the folks at MDA now for for a question around you know, recruiting and, and security requirements and things like that. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, this is something that's come up. Uh, I've heard this talked about a couple of times as well and then through through my discussions. So, you know, the oftentimes when you're, you know, working in the in the technology areas you are, there might be some restrictions around controlled goods. Um, ITAR, if you're doing things with the United States, these are all um, international trade and arms regulations and yeah. Uh, the, things like that. So, you know, and we we have a, a very strong immigration program here in Canada. We're you know able to work through, uh, you know, different groups to bring in people from around the world that have skills that that we need here. Uh, how do how do these security requirements impact your hiring at MDA? And what would you say to someone who, you know, um, may not qualify for let's say like a secret clearance? Are there opportunities there? Yeah. So so what else? say is that every every person that we bring in at a minimum has to uh, has to be able to achieve control goods clearance um, and uh, reliability and in some programs uh, the the requirements may be higher it could be secret uh, um, uh, etc uh, to to get reliability clearance uh, in Canada, you you need to have five years of verifiable history in Canada or within a country that has a um, a bilateral security instrument with Canada, right? So uh, there's a whole list uh, NATO countries. Um, uh, you know, there, there's a, a long list of countries that, uh, that that qualify for that. I will say that uh, that that when um, when somebody's five years is not actually in Canada, it will take uh, a little bit longer. And, you know, sort of post COVID, we are seeing that take uh, significantly longer. Although we've been in discussions with the uh, federal government uh, around how we can, um, you know, expedite that. Uh, uh, because, you know, there there is, there's there's a recognized need uh, to bring talent in uh, for, for some of the roles. There's some very specialized roles that we need to fill. That, that the talent pool does not exist in Canada, right? We need to go. Uh, we need to go outside. We've got people here in the room here that uh, that you know have brought uh, very specialized skills from abroad uh, that we uh, as as an organization would would love to be able to tap into. So so we're working very diligently to to try to expedite that that process. We're working with with our partners in the federal government to find ways of doing that. Excellent, thank you. And I know there's, um, you know, over the last couple of years with the pandemic and everything, there's been a lot of uh, attention being given to that. Like, how do we mm -hmm. safely, reliably bring people in that we that we need here uh, to the work? So that's uh, awesome. Thank you. Um, we've got a few questions around energy and space and, and how that will all uh, be taken care of. Uh, space debris, things like that, uh, that, that I think we could that we could get into, but there was uh, Dr. Z. Sorry, I've lost it. There was a, a question around SFL um, and and what you do for conducting uh, you know the training around the mission control teams uh, around contingency and and emergency response training. I'm wondering, uh, Rob, if there's if there's a few things you could say around the you know when you are training a mission control team. Just just quickly, what are some of the the uh, the things that you're that you include in that training there and what what you look for yeah thank you craig um so in delivering mission services uh we all 
also have to worry about commissioning and operating spacecraft. And so prior to launch, um, we are heavily engaged in in actually going through the expected operations with the spacecraft on the ground. And so we we come up with uh, an operations plan uh, that essentially goes over routine operating tasks, um, procedures for that, but also there are contingency operations um, that are documented as well. And, uh, and you know, whoever we're training and very often we have students involved in, in operations as well, uh, they will work side by side with people that uh, have done it before. Uh, so they don't just have to read documentation, but they'll get hands on uh, guidance from from mentors, experienced mentors. And uh, we not only train our own students in how to operate spacecraft, but we also uh, train our customers, our clients. Um, on how to operate their spacecraft if if there's uh, interest there. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a process, uh, but it begins before launch and and we go through the training that's needed uh, with the actual spacecraft, with our satellite equipment on the bench uh beforehand and um and prior to the pre-ship review and then um you know during commissioning uh we get more hands-on and it becomes hands-on training actually during the commissioning period hopefully that answers the question i think so that's uh that was great and uh thanks for that i'll move on to a specific question for for Lori. I think I saw that you were you were writing a response to that in the in the, in the Q and A chat as well. But maybe you could uh, just share that uh, share that with the group here. This was um, this was the question was uh, around the timing of these different uh, uh, commercial uh, applications of the gateway and the other systems that were that were up on your slide there. Um, I mean for. For me, what's exciting is I've, you know, I've been really focused on Canada Arm 3 and the significant opportunities that's going to bring to to the region and to, to the country, really. But then you have all these other uh, opportunities you brought up. Um, so just uh, timing wise, uh, what we're looking there and then any other, you know, interesting insights you want to throw in. We'd love to hear that as well around, you know, the, the, these opportunities here. Yeah, I'd say it's a uh, it's a tight race right now between the uh, the gateway system, uh, Artemis missions, and the commercial Leo. Like the um, the ISS is uh, going to sunset around the end of the decade, and um, NASA has a big push to make sure when the the ISS uh, uh, finishes up operations that these uh, commercial stations, at least one or two, are in place to continue the operations and low earth orbit so there's companies buying to be first so this is like commercially driven companies are raising money to uh, fund these stations making partnerships uh, they're going like full out commercial um, against the the government program and uh, it'll be really interesting to see who comes first i, I don't know uh, i don't know who i'd bet on right now <laughs> awesome uh, well Thank you. Um, I think we'll uh, I, I, we're we're a little bit over time, so we'll we'll wrap it up with one question. And what I'm what I'm going to do for this one is sort of roll through um, our presenters here uh, in the order in the order they presented, starting with uh, with, with Daryl. I will not ask myself anything. I uh, I don't need to do that. And then we'll go Brian, Doctor Z, and then uh, Laurie and Dave. But the question that we had from from the audience is it's pretty broad, and I'll. I'll I hope uh, Anonymous doesn't mind me narrowing down the scope of their question. Uh, they, they were asking what the biggest challenges Canada, Canada faces in the space industry and uh, how are companies addressing these challenges to ensure our, our long term success. Um, disadvantage to you folks at MDA because you're going to be responding last, but uh, <laughs> starting with you, Daryl, if you don't mind, what would you say? The, just one, what would be uh, you know, the big challenge facing uh, Canada in space, and uh, what can we do to make sure we're all right by it? Yeah, it's a good question, um, and thanks for the question. I would say it's the ability to um, try something new, to be able to see that um, you know we're expanding a new frontier, is pioneering on something new that perhaps 
not everyone is aware of and not everyone has the understanding. And even for myself as a generalist, um, I always look at to see what the professionals are, professionals are doing and you're watching as an observer to see what's happening in the space economy. But when you're in a situation like this, in a room like this, hearing from experts, you see the potential for growth, the opportunity to seek something new, the opportunities for new roles in the space sector. And I think the biggest challenge is, is allowing ourselves, even as governments, agencies, and individuals, and even as taxpayers, Canadians, explorers, academia, asking ourselves, how much will we push ourselves to see something new and to be a bit less risk adverse? Yeah, definitely high risk area here, and we, we have to be comfortable with that, right? And, or we'll, we'll miss out on the opportunities. Uh, Brian, uh, Glenn, wondering if uh, same question over to you. You can't use the same challenge, so uh, <laughs> there it is. But uh, yeah, what, what's uh, what's a big big challenge that we're facing here in Canada, and uh, what what can what can we do to uh, you know make sure we don't miss out on this this great opportunity in front of us right now? Well, to build a little bit on what Daryl said, I think that the idea that we have years to decide if we want to really double down, really want to prioritize, really sort of focus on the opportunities that this sector represents for Canada, um, I just don't think is the case, right? I think I think we're in a pretty crucial moment in time, and this is an emerging industry. There's, uh, as already mentioned, things are things are moving quite quickly. So as a as a society, we have to prioritize this. Uh, and, and again, not to be a broken record, but government needs to prioritize it. When I went through some of the investments of some of the big players in space, although Canada has Im 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 just immense and impressive uh, um, uh, success stories when it comes to space, comparable to those countries that I mentioned that are investing billions upon billions of dollars yearly, uh, and then Canada is investing a fraction of that, right? So it's pretty incredible what we've been able to do. And the reason, you know, Canadians are awesome, and uh, and of course there are a lot of businesses uh, that are that businesses and 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 uh, and stakeholders within the ecosystem are doing incredible things. But but given that we're we're um, well well suited to do this, uh, given that it's such an emerging opportunity, I just hope that we jump on it as quickly as possible. And then and then the context, of course is the fact that a bunch of other countries are definitely jumping on it. They, they're, they're very aware that there are immense opportunity. And, and I keep using opportunities. I want to be half, you know, glass half full, but but there's also risks. And yeah, there's risks of investment sometimes in an emerging industry and in something that's changing, sure. Uh, there's, there's no question. But at the same time, there are risks if we don't make these types of investments. And, and we don't talk about that probably as much as we should as we try to be positive Canadians, but but there are there are things that could be quite negative if we don't uh, step up and and on the economic front, but also some of the challenges that uh, that I alluded to in my opening remarks, uh, we won't be as well suited to to tackle them. So, anyways, all that to say, uh, that would be the biggest challenge that we sort of sit sit on our, our rest on our laurels while other countries step up in a massive way. Excellent. Yeah, Excellent. I think. Yeah, um, Oh, you heard an echo there for a second, but yeah, no, thanks for that. This is, uh, you know, we, we have to be comfortable just doing these things now, right? And the the irony here is that we have to move fast to do something that's going to take a heck of a long time, right? I mean, we have we have a cliche that uh, in, the, in the defense sector that I, that I use all the time, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Well, we've got to run to the start line for our marathon here, right? It is, is sort of where we're at. And uh, yeah, definitely lots of lots of opportunities out there and uh, the comfort with risk, I think, is, is, is going to be tough. I've, uh, if there's time at the end, I've got a little a little story about just the way this day and this event came together. That's that's right in line with, I think, what what I've heard from both of you guys. But first, we'll uh, we'll go to Dr. Z uh, over at SFL. Um, so big challenge facing uh, Canadians in space for, for Canadians and, and what uh, what do we need to be aware of and, and do to make sure we don't miss out? I think one of the challenges that Canadians face is the so-called not invented in Canada syndrome. Right? There are traditional attitudes out there where we can't do that in Canada because we've never done it before. And I guess it ties into what was said earlier about risk. Uh, and I, I hate to do it. I hate to be the, the Star Trek geek that quotes Captain Kirk, but risk is why we're out here. <laughs> it was right? bound to happen, Dr. Z. Uh, <laughs> I'm surprised it took so, so long. <laughs> so risk is why we're out here. And I know that SFL in 
in particular wouldn't have survived all of these years if we had not gone international and and had partners internationally and and people wanting to be entrepreneurs internationally uh, that we were able to help. Uh, another aspect that's a challenge in Canada is the way funding is handled. And I, I think some companies have, some startups that we've helped have actually said to me that, you know, Canada is great for seed funding, putting in initial dollars. Uh, but once the, something gets going, once a company gets going, um, the funding sort of disappears and the company is on on their own. And so, uh, you know, many companies have a hard time sustaining themselves through to maturity. And I think, um, you know, if we can do better in that area, uh, even if it's just, you know, creating markets, helping to create markets to sustain these companies as their businesses are growing so that they can branch out internationally, I think that would be a tremendous thing going forward. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Dave, uh, do you want to? Uh, yeah, okay. Or, or Laurie, I'll, I'll, whoever, go, I'll, I'll okay. go first, and then maybe Laurie can uh, correct me. <laughs> Um, and, and great, uh, great answers, um, uh, very macro level. Uh, I'm going to pivot and kind of answer it at a micro level and, and um, you know, maybe a bit of a self-serving kind of answer. And I'm going I'm to say talent. Uh, you know, talent uh, is, is a big challenge for us. Uh, we're, we're, we're not necessarily competing with the space industry for for talent. We're competing with technology industries, right? So, you know, we're uh, you know we're almost everybody that we uh, are making offers to uh, today. They have multiple offers on the table, and they're coming from the likes of Amazon and um, you know uh, uh, defense contractors and and um, you know technology companies. Um, you know, so so we're competing, you know, on a global stage for uh, for talent. We're we're competing uh, with U.S. employers who are employing people remotely here in Canada. Um, so you know, it's it's a uh, it's it's tough to go out and find the best talent uh, available. So uh, that's my pitch to all of you great people out there. To uh, you know, there's great opportunities here, and and we you know we're, we're uh, eager to talk to you. Nice. Anything to add, Larry? Or a whole different yeah. idea of a new challenge? No, nope, uh, <laughs> double down on that. And uh, the um, the other thought I had has already been touched upon a couple times uh, already, and that's uh, uh, it's a boring one with the regulatory and policy issues like the ITAR and the CGP, and how can we streamline our ability to uh, work work through these uh, policy issues. So to Brian's point about the National Space Council, uh, just yeah. having a one-stop shopping to uh, plow through these issues and uh, and not get have Canadian companies get gummed up in policy and regulation. I'll triple down on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great, okay. Uh, thanks, Laurie. Uh, everyone, so I just wanna quickly thank um, you know the whole the whole panel here for everyone taking their time to you know to, to spend with us this afternoon uh, such interesting things everyone talked about um you know i think we'll we'll hand it over to daryl here to to give the big uh the the, the final word but before the final word the, the penultimate word yes. uh, for me is just thank you to everyone uh, hikaru i want to do a special thank you to you for producing uh the event today and keeping us going that was wonderful um Amazing! All the support that we had from our uh, our IT folks that are I don't even know where they are. Their voice just comes out of the sky and <laughs> and lets us know that things are good. So that's been wonderful. Um, you know the, the the building staff here in Toronto that let us use the office was great. Uh, just yeah, there, there there's my Oscar speech. Thank you. Uh, moment. I'll I'll, right. I'll be quiet now. Daryl, uh, over to you for the final goodbye, and we'll. Uh, uh, release our panelists back to the wild and thank you for, for sticking around for these few extra minutes. I appreciate that. Sounds good. Well, um, I just, I guess I took a little, some, a few notes, what everyone was saying. So I will up a synopsis in 30 seconds, hopefully. Um, to Dave Mann, the HR director for MBA, uh, we spoke about geo intelligence, the search for talent, the new center of robotic operations in Brampton. To his colleague, Laurie Chappell, the senior director of new business at MDA, talking about 
CADARM3 program and the many growth opportunities there. Brian Galat, CEO of Space Canada, awareness of the multi-trillion industry. Wow, that was revealing. Um, and advocating for a national space council and a holistic approach in advancing the space ecosystem. Dr. So, sorry, well, do you think we'll be able to say quadrillion at some point? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> hold it to Brian to come up with that one. Um, Dr. Robert Z of the Space Flight Laboratory at the University of Toronto Institute for Aerospace Studies. Cool low-cost emissions and creating smaller satellites with bigger returns. And then finally to you, Craig, your senior analyst at industry, industrial participation with the Federal Economic Development Agency for Southern Ontario, speaking about strategic innovation in the space economy and awareness of just how expansive the industry is in Ontario and so paramount to our economy. And um, thank you all for everyone. This is really a, a great highlight for me uh, to be around such great expertise. Um, and a few words of thanks finally to our speakers highlighting one of um, uh, one of these things today, a token of our thanks on behalf of Space Place Canada uh, that we'll be providing a tasty gift from Peace by Chocolate, a Canadian chocolate company based in Antigonish, Nova Scotia, founded by the Haddads, a Syrian refugee success story here in Canada. Wow. And so um, what a great example of collaborating, thinking big beyond ourselves. And um, thank you for all your participants and the great questions even online. And for those of you watching, um, thank you for joining us today and have a great day. Awesome. And with that, uh, thank you very much. We'll, we'll end the end of the broadcast now. So lovely. Thank you, everyone.